We've been in the book of uh, Acts for a few weeks now, and um, it's, it's an amazing book. It's actually the actions of the apostles. And I, you know how clever I am. I said, well, we'll call it the actions of New Holland. And I hope the actions of New Holland are like what are described in the Acts of the Apostles. Jesus had uh, gone to the cross. He had uh, given his life for the ransom for our soul. He had paid the penalty. He, had, they, he gave his life. They couldn't take it, but he gave it freely. They buried him, put a period at the end of that sentence and thought that was it. He's done, it's over with. But on resurrection morning, Everything changed. Life came. He defeated death forevermore. And not only did he defeat it for him, he defeated it for us so that we could have new life, everlasting life, abundant life. And I'm so gloriously saved and I'm so grateful for all that God's done in my life. He spent 40 days with his disciples showing himself around. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, at one time, almost five or 500 people saw him at one time. Just an amazing fact, something that they could not deny. The testimony was known by all. It was, a, it was a buzz, but then he went back to glory, raised his hands, ascended back. I always say the law of gravity was suspended, and he went home to make a, to make a way for us, go to prepare a place for us. And then the disciples came together, and that word that we've been looking at, it's all through there, and it's so very important, one accord. They stayed in one accord. They, they just, for 10 days, they were there just uh, rejoicing, thinking. You know, uh, when I went to seminary, that's what they said the definition of theology was, was thinking about God. So they were thinking. They were doing theology. They, was, they were wondering. They, 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 heard, they heard his last words, and he said, wait. Wait until the power of the Holy Spirit comes. But when it came... It came. It changed them from the inside out. Y'all remember what that's like? What a glorious day. I went to the altar when I was 10 crying. I got up smiling. Only God can do that. I felt like the world was going to cave in on me. Then I felt like I could fly all the way home. I've never gotten over what it means when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you to bless you. And, and to be very honest, I still can't get over the wonder that God loves me. In the way that he does, that he in the, the big word is he imputed righteousness. He put his righteousness on me. And we get the great privilege of walking that out every day. He's only a whisper away. And that's what they had to learn, was they had to learn what it meant to walk it out. So when we have been traveling through the, the book of Acts, we've been seeing how they've been walking out this new life in Christ that they had. When we came to chapter 3, they were going to the temple to pray, and there was a lame man there who was looking for a handout. But he, Peter said, silver and gold I don't have. But what I do have, what has been given to me, I be, would be more than willing to give to you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And the power of God came and hit that man. And Peter reached out his hand to grab him, to help him up. By faith, he's believing, he's trusting. And God said, amen. And God amened it and the man was healed. And the Bible says he was leaping, walking and leaping around. Y'all like that? For his whole life, he had never had strength in his legs. He could never walk. But now when God touched him, he was jumping up and down in joy. Amen? I think that's what I'm going to do when I get to heaven. We're all going to have our fun little times. I believe I'm going to be one of the cheerleaders, Brother Jim. I believe I'm, I can't do a somersault now, but I'm going to try it then. Amen? Because there, there's no tears in heaven. So, amen? No accidents in glory. What a day it was for him. But let me just remind you that when God shows up in power, Satan does all that he can to prevent the flow of that power. Satan cannot prevent the power of God. You need to hear that in your heart. Satan cannot stunt the power of salvation. Everything that God in His nature 
He bestows upon us love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. All of the very attributes of the nature of God are ours, and Satan cannot stunt that. I'm going to say that again because you need to hear this. When you're walking through life and in circumstances and in difficulties and in hardships and you feel the pressure of life coming against you, you need to know that if you are a Christian, if Jesus has saved you, I love this word, to the uttermost, then you have all of the power of God availed to you. Satan can't stop that. All of the very nature of the goodness of God, he came so that he could bestow that upon us. Satan cannot stunt that. He cannot keep that from happening. So what he does is try to influence, influence us. Not to believe that. Not to trust that. Not to rely upon that. To rely upon ourselves or anything else. He knows that he's a defeated foe. He knows that he doesn't have the power of God. And for some reason, he understands that God wants to bestow that upon us, not just in heaven, but the Spirit of God living within us now for his glory and for our benefit. So Satan does everything he can to keep us from being used by God. So what does Satan do? This guy gets saved. It's going through the temple. 2,000 people get saved. 3,000 at Pentecost, 2,000 more. You know how they knew that? Because they were baptized. The first act of obedience was for them to come forward and to be baptized. It was their public profession of faith showing the death, burial, and resurrection. That's what Christ did for them. And they were willing to say, yes, this is who I am. This is what I want to do. So who opposed them? If you have your Bible, stand up in honor of reading God's Word. Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now as they spoke to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple... The Sadducees came upon them being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Just let me pause there for a moment. They never could stand against the resurrection. They could not disprove it. They just wanted them to quit preaching about it because that's the power of the gospel. And they laid hands on them put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, praise God, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And it came to pass on the next day that the rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, I love this phrase. You're going to see it all through the book of Acts. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Said to them, um, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, that's respectful. If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all that, and, and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole, complete. Because when God does a miracle, he does it completely. No half miracles involved. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. And verse 12, one of the most glorious verses in Scripture. Now, nor is there salvation in any other. That settles it. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Let's pray. Now, Father God, we pray that you will add the blessings to your word. We pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would speak, that you would quicken in our spirits, 
not only the power of your word, but the presence of that word for us. Lord, help us to have faith to trust you today. Help us to believe. Help us not to listen to ourselves or to the world. For Lord, we know our inadequacies, but we also know you're very much your adequacies. Where we cannot, you are the God who can. You are the I am. Praise God, you are the I will. So Lord, I just pray that in the next few moments that we will see the life pattern for us that you have for us to live as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. I love here that Peter does not try to take matters into his own hands. He's not trying to argue with him. When they took him and, and put him in prisons, he did not fight back. He did not argue. He was not ugly. He was not trying to defend himself in any way, shape, form, or fashion. He simply put into the words what the Lord put into his heart. If we can be filled with the Holy Spirit, if we can learn to pray and listen, if we can position ourselves in such a place to allow God to open up our lives and use our lives, people often say to me, Pastor, I don't know how. It's okay, we know the one who does. I might say something wrong. If you'll follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, you'll be just fine. The sheep know the voice of the master. And when he speaks, we respond if he's master. If we just can open up and let our words be what he is saying in our heart, then after we've spent time with God, there, there's something that comes that is amazing. It's a boldness that comes from knowing the truth and speaking the truth in love. He says in verse 7, by what power are you doing this? Well, they knew why by what power, because it says they were filled with that power. Let me tell you what Satan tries to do. He doesn't want you filled. He wants you to be comfortable living a life of being commingled with a little bit of God and a little bit of you and a little bit of the wisdom of this world and a lot of the ways of this world. He wants you to have faith in God. He knows that he can't take that away, but he also wants you to have a little fear of the world. If he can get you commingled, if he can get you distracted, if he can get you looking around and saying, well, that's a great thing, but I've got all these other things that are going on in the same life. If he can get us to the point where we surrender, if Satan can get us to not surrender to God, but to surrender to anything else, Satan doesn't always come with something ugly for you to choose. He may want to get you to come and choose something that's very beautiful to you, but it's not God first. And in our society, our society is growing down because we want to talk about our rights. We want to talk about what we deserve. I deserve hell. I am a sinner. I was a sinner. Now I'm a saved sinner. Yes, I have the imputed righteousness of God, but I still mess up. Distracted. By what power? Well, they knew why, by what power. They were filled with the Holy Spirit of God. They didn't take any of this upon themselves. Look at me, look what good I did. I, I helped this man. No, no, no. He just said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He said, in the name of Jesus, we've done this. The one who you, you, he's pointing the finger at them, you crucified, who God raised from the dead. And they did not come back and said, that's not true. They just ignored that part totally and completely. No other name, it says in verse 12. One salvation in Christ alone. There is uh, plenty of people who say they, uh, Rick and I, I almost said it was Lance, but it was you and, you and I, we were 
talking, what was it, Tuesday, Wednesday, and, and he was showing a clip that they were, was, was it Wednesday or Thursday? It was Wednesday, wasn't it? And uh, he was showing a clip, on, and they were asking people questions about heaven and, and salvation. And people said, well, I just think everybody can make it. You know, God's, God's a God of love. He'll, he'll just, God wouldn't send anybody to, to a place that he called hell. I'm a good person. Anybody in here perfect? If you are, you got to leave because there's no perfect people allowed inside. Just saved by the power of God and those who are far from God who need to be saved. No perfect people, just saved people. I've heard the illustration that, that, that people think that heaven's like a mountain and, and it doesn't really matter which side of the mountain you come up as long as we all get to there on the top. You know what that's called? The Greek word for that is baloney. It's a lie. It's a lie of the devil. He's the father of lies. He's good at it. Do y'all believe lies? Yeah, you do. Sometimes even if you know the truth, it might creep into the back of your mind a little bit. No other name under, in, under heaven whereby you must be saved. Look at verse 13. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. Listen how bold these guys are. They haven't been to synagogue school. They're bold and, and they're uneducated. Nobody, we didn't train these people. They didn't like it. They didn't want someone telling them that they were wrong. You need to be loving. You need to be kind. You're never going to Get to the place where you're showing somebody the, the love of God by being rude to them. You need to talk to that person like you would want someone to talk to your mom with kindness and love and respect. It's not about winning a battle. You can win a battle and lose the war. You can make it to where someone doesn't even want to hear about Christ by how you're trying to present Christ. They were offended. And they made up their mind, we've got to do something about this. I love in the end of verse 13, it says, they realized that they had been with Jesus. When they looked at Peter, it sure did remind them of Jesus. Tender, kind, bold, and speaking the truth in love. Look what it says in verse 15. But when they had commanded them to go outside of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, what should we do to these men? For indeed, a noble act, miracle has been done through them and it's evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. You know what they're trying to say? I wish we could lie about it, but we can't. Nobody will believe it. This is a good thing that happened. So what are we going to do to stop them? Wouldn't it have been great if they said, you know, there may be something to this. Maybe we need to listen a little bit more. I wonder in their heart if the Holy Spirit was kind of maybe even beating in their life, but they had to beat it down because they wanted something else. Not willing to listen. They had made up their mind before Peter even spoke, before Jesus even spoke. Verse 17, but so that it spread no further among the people, let us severely threaten them. That's all they got, it's fear. Fear that from now on they speak to no man in this name. You better not speak if you do. We're going to get you. We're going to get you severely. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. That's what they wanted. But Peter and John answered. These old fishermen... Hard-headed and stubborn, praise God. You know, if you're stubborn for Jesus, bless you. I didn't get an amen on that, Rick. Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. That's, I'll leave that up to you. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We can not. But speak. I got a bad case of that. I can't help it. I can't help it. 
It just comes out. I can't help it. I'm going to talk to somebody about Christ. See, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it splashes over on everybody around you. You just want to, you just want to love people in Jesus' name. And come on now, the blessings that you've received, that you're grateful for, that you never want to turn back from, the love that just comes up within you that's unexplainable to the world, the joy, listen, the peace. The, the quiet calm in your soul. When you go to bed at night, no darkness, just light. A settled spirit. The comfort of God. You don't ever want to lose that. And when you see others, you want the blessings to them. I grant you that if something magnificent happens to us in our life, we want to share it with others. And Satan doesn't care if you do that unless the thing that you got was Jesus. Now he'll tell you, no, you can't talk about that. How many of y'all have heard the saying, we're not supposed to talk about religion or politics? Well, I don't talk about politics. I mean, except in my prayers. God bless them, you know. Heal the heathen, you know. Pray for our nation. Pray for our leaders. Lord, save some of them. Give them boldness to stand up and do the right thing. But why can't we talk to people about the greatest thing that ever happened to us in our life? Why is that off limits? Now, I'm going to ask a question here. Don't, don't answer out loud. But how many of you feel like if you're going to talk to somebody and the Holy Spirit's leading you to talk to somebody, in the back of your mind, in the back of your heart, there is a cringe saying, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I might offend them. Oh. I might offend them. I don't know. They might not like me. They won't invite me to their birthday party. Oh, I don't know. I work with them. They may report me. How many of you don't answer out loud? And yet, knowing what you know right now, if you were lost, you would want somebody to come beg you to Christ. Well, Verse 21, so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom the miracle of healing had been performed. Y'all just go and don't ever do that again. That's what they told him. Verse 23, being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they had heard that, they raised their voices to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. You're on the throne in heaven. God, you give us life. You give us breath. There is no power in all the earth like you who by the mouth of your servant David had said, folks, they're quoting scripture. Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? It doesn't make sense, but it's true. The kings of the earth took their stand. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Lord, there's nothing happening to us, but something that you didn't tell us was going to happen. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever, come on now, your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. You allowed it, God. You could have stopped it, but you allowed it to happen. Now, Lord, look on their threats and kill them. Is that what he says? No, we're not worried about them. What we, we want their souls to be saved too. Y'all look up here. And some of them were. Some of those people gave their heart and life to Christ as well. Don't give up on the person that everybody else has given up on. Don't prejudge what God can do. You may look at someone and you, you may have those magical eyes that can look at someone and before you ever speak to them, you can determine whether they would love to accept Jesus Christ into their heart. I don't have those eyes. By the way, neither do you. You just think you do. How many of you believe rich people need to be saved? How many of you believe poor people need to be saved? 
How many of you believe people who got it all together as far as this world's concerned need Jesus? How many of you believe that a guy that's been to rehab 22 times needs Jesus? How about the guy that cheats on his taxes? You think he needs Jesus? How about the, the woman who cheats on her husband? Right? What about the one who cheats at work? What about the one who abuses? What about the one who even abuses children? Do they need Jesus? People need the Lord, right? Well, he says, and this is their prayer, Lord, look on their threats, but Lord, grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. <laughs> Lord, I'm not worried about them, but Lord, would you please give me boldness? By stretching out your hand to heal that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they prayed, verse 31 says, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Greg Laurie, a great evangelist, made this statement. I wrote it down. There are three reasons we don't share the gospel. And by the way, if you are offended by any of these three, don't get mad at me, get mad at Greg Laurie. He says, number one, we are uncaring. We are uncomfortable. And we are unconvinced. I think a lot of times we say that we care, I'm just not sure that we do by our actions. I think most are uncomfortable until they get used to doing it. And for those that are unconvinced, you need to get along with God and realize what God's done for you. Are you convinced there's a heaven? Are you convinced there's a hell? Hell is forever. Hell is forever and ever. Separated from everything of the nature of God. There is no love. There is no goodness. There is no joy. The opposite of. There is no peace. Forever. No one argues if there's heaven because they all want to go. They just think there's many, many ways to get there. But they don't want to admit that there's a hell because if there is a hell, then they've got to do something. I don't know that y'all know this. Did y'all know that Jesus taught more about hell than he did heaven? You think he was trying to get a point across? And he taught more about money than he did that. Because you see, he knew that's one of the things that would distract us is living for ourself. Y'all are good people, and I love you. You're amazing. You care. You care. And there's a thousand things in our life that we do well. But I'm here to tell you there's one area in our life that if we're going to drift, it's going to be our care and concern for lost people. I'll be honest with you. I'm not talking to you something about, about something that I haven't spent time on my knees about too. As a pastor, my job is to model. I can't do everything. But I need to model it. And the Lord's been... And, and I talk to people about the Lord. I have gospel conversations. I had one planned yesterday, and they text me early in the morning and said, my stomach's tore up. I can't meet with you. I said, all right. I said, well, come to church. They didn't. Um, I said, we'll meet after church. I planned those conversations. 
But I'm also open to when the Holy Spirit leads me to someone to talk to those people. You may not be comfortable with talking just to someone at the fence between your yard and your neighbor's yard or in the parking lot outside Kroger. Though we'll talk to them about anything else in the parking lot at Kroger. I'm not even going to talk about Walmart because there's all kinds of conversations that don't need to be talked about in church at Walmart. But we've, we've allowed some other things to happen. We've, we'll invite them to church. That's a good thing. But you know what we mostly do? We, we mostly invite Christians to church. People that are already saved, we invite them. Okay, if, if they don't have a good church home, we would love to try to be that church home for them. Family. If we were as inviting as many lost people as we were saved people. But we're going to have to get out of our comfort zone, folks. Love the ones far from God. Build relationships with people that you know are lost. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of a gospel conversation. It's the most glorious thing. There are times that I've been uncomfortable talking to someone and watch the simple gospel presented and received and something goes on in my life. I get so fired up. Now, if you've seen me at a Georgia football game, I can do a go dogs as loud. You know my voice. I can do it louder than anybody. But when somebody gets saved, Brother Jim, if I could do cartwheels driving down the road, I would. I mean, it is a joy unspeakable and full of glory. I'm more tickled about it than they are. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Kale, pull that up for us. If you have your phone, you can do it. But I'm going to share something with you that is extremely simple. And you say, Pastor, why are you taking the time church to do this? This is, a, this is an arrow that you need in your quiver. It, people always say, I just don't know that I know everything that I need to say. I'm afraid I won't do it right. Well, on this app, it simply comes up and it looks like it does on the screen there. And there's an arrow right here on my phone. And you push the red arrow, and it takes you to the next screen. Go ahead, Kale. And it talks about God's design. And underneath it, it shows you the words that you can share to them. It says, we see beauty, purpose, and evidence of God's design around us. The Bible tells us that God originally planned a world that worked perfectly, where everything and everyone fit together in harmony. God made each of us with a purpose to worship Him and to walk with Him. And then it quotes Genesis 1.31. God saw all that He made and it was very good. And it quotes Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky proclaims the works of His hands. And you push the buttons and it takes you to this. We have a problem. It's called sin. Life doesn't work when we ignore God and His original design for our life. We selfishly insist on doing things our own way. The Bible calls this sin. We all sin and distort the original design. The consequences of our sin is separation from God in this life and for all eternity. And it quotes Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. And you push the button. And it takes you to the next screen. And that's brokenness. When we have sin in our life, our lives become broken. Sin leads to a place of brokenness. We see this all around us and in our own lives as well. I'm, I'm reading it to you. When we realize life is not working, we begin to look for a way out. We tend to go in many different directions trying things to figure it out on our own. We try religion. We try to be good. We try to be generous. You can just be a generous sinner. It won't get you there. Brokenness leads to a, a place realizing a need for something greater. And it quotes 
Romans 1.25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served something created instead of the Creator. You push the button, and it take, talks about the gospel. At this point, we need a remedy. We need some good news, and that's what gospel means. Gospel means good news. Because of his love, God did not leave us in our brokenness. Jesus, God in human flesh, came to us, lived perfectly according to God's design. Jesus came to rescue us, to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. He took our sin and shame to the cross, paying the penalty for our sin by his death. Jesus was then raised from the dead to provide the only way for us to be rescued and restored to a relationship with God. And it quotes John 3.16, and it quotes Colossians 2.14. He erased the certificate of debt and has taken it out of the way by nailing it to the cross. And we push the button. And it says, repentance and believe. Simply hearing this good news is not enough. We must admit our sinful brokenness and stop trusting ourselves. We don't have the power to escape the brokenness on our own. We need to be rescued. We must ask God to forgive us, turn Him from sin, trust only in Jesus. This is what it means to repent and believe. Believing, we receive new life through Jesus, and God turns our lives into a new direction. It quotes Mark 1.15, repent and believe in the good news. It quotes Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for you are saved by grace through faith, yet not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. And then it quotes Romans 10, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you would be saved. Then you push the button, and it says, Re recover and pursue. When God restores our relationship to Him, we begin to discover meaning and purpose in a broken world. Now we can pursue God's design in all areas of our life. Even when we fall, we understand God's pathway to be restored, this same good news of Jesus Christ. God's Spirit empowers us to pursue His design and assures us of his presence in this life and for all of eternity. Philippians 2.13 says this, For it is God who is working in you, enabling you both to desire and to work out his good purpose. What should I do? You press the button. Now that you've heard this good news, God wants you to respond to him. You can talk to him using these words, and it gives a simple prayer. Three minutes. You're not preaching. They won't attack you because it's the gospel. You can show them. Used to, we had tracks. We give tracks. And uh, I, I, y'all know I'm going to tell the truth. A lot of them were cheesy. But the gospel's not cheesy. And there are no twisting arms into heaven. That's not how it works. It's just given an opportunity. Now, even in this moment, you're going to start thinking among yourself, I can't do that. How many of y'all graduated second grade? It didn't take me but one year. Praise God, hallelujah, amen. Anybody illiterate in here? I know everybody calls me illiterate, but it means something else other than I can't read. It means I'm stupid. But even if you cannot read, you can pull it up on your phone and you can ask them to read it. I wonder, are we willing to try? Three years ago, I begin to talk to you about who's your one. The one person that you pray for every day. 
someone that's far from God. You pray for them. There'll be times that you will pray tears over them. You will pray unbelievable, heartfelt prayers for them. You'll pray that God would create a way, that God would open a door where you could share three minutes of the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. How many got distracted? How many of you forgot your one? It began by not praying for them every day. We just begin to slide. And then some said this, you know, I don't know any lost people. Walk up and down your street. Go to Walmart. They're all over the place. I just wonder, could we build a relationship with someone that might make us uncomfortable, but it will make them feel great. After COVID, one of the things that we've learned, we are the loneliest we've ever been. We are the most isolated we've ever been. This is how people get along with other people today. Y'all watching? <laughs> He's an idiot. I can't believe he did that. And we scroll. Oh, I got friends. I got 2,500 friends on Facebook. I hadn't talked to them in 62 years, but I, I'm a friend on Facebook. What are we doing? We're following the ways of the world rather than the ways of the good news of Jesus Christ. Your pastor needs to lead people to Jesus. But don't put it off on me. I'm going to take some people to heaven with me. And I hope you do too. They say there's a party in heaven every time somebody gets saved. I want to join the party when I die. Don't you? It's not that we can't. It's just... Will we?